We are once again assembled to celebrate Bastille Day. The fall of the Bastille acted as a clarion cry to radical forces throughout Europe and nowhere more so than here in Belfast. This then modest town of some 20,000 was the founding centre of the Society of United Irishmen and was arguably the most progressive, indeed revolutionary, centre in the British Isles. In July 1792, a quarter of the population turned out to pass a unanimous resolution supporting the French revolutionaries. In 1793, our democratic era came to an end. As Britain went to war with France, and the United Irishmen were driven underground and on the road to rebellion. Thus, we are also meeting on the 225th anniversary of the United Irish Rising of 1798. That movement remains an inspiration to us in Reclaim the Enlightenment today, despite their catastrophic defeat at the time. No one should doubt the seriousness of that endeavour. Some 27,000 turned out in Ulster. The frontal assault on Antrim Town and the ferocious battle of Ballinahinch say enough. We should ignore attempts to dismiss the significance of this. The foolish suggestion that because the rising in Ulster was delayed, it was not part of an overall all-Ireland endeavour, that it was a case of ourselves alone, and hence inexplicable. The pattern of events in Ulster was very similar to that elsewhere on the island. The poorly armed rebels could achieve victories against foolhardy yeomanry forces, as at the Battle of St. Field, or against the Yeoman Cavalry at the Battle of Antrim. But there were no match for regular forces and their artillery. The response of the rank and file was typical. If there was a chance of victory, they were ready to advance. But if there was bad news, they melted away. I always say that men were attached to their own townlands as though by a rubber band. They could stretch that rubber band to move forward, but in adverse circumstances they were pulled inexorably homewards. That was the case as after the defeat at Antrim Town, the rebellion collapsed elsewhere in the county. We mourn the deaths of some 30,000 who died in that conflict. We particularly lament the loss of those at the forefront of the progressive cause. What, then, of those who opposed the United Irishmen? Let us regret equally their deaths, but let others, if they must, celebrate their agendas their opposition to democratic reforms, and their acceptance and encouragement of communal division as a bulwark against change. The defeat of the United Irishmen often left no more than a crude memory of what they had stood for. Yes, indeed, they demanded an independent Ireland, but that is often remembered at the expense of forgetting the uniquely progressive nature of the independence that they sought. The United Irishmen also have to be remembered for engaging in the armed struggle, yet they did so in the dire circumstances of the late 1790s. Subsequently, republicanism was too often reduced to a self-standing principle of commitment to the armed struggle, and very little else, and this regardless of circumstance. Armed struggle should always be a tactic of last resort, rather than an overriding principle. The victors in 1798 forgot one important lesson that the systematic exclusion of any major section of the community from power 
inevitably breeds revolt in one form or another. That was a lesson that they and the rest of us had to painfully learn in the latter part of the 20th century. What then of those largely forgotten ideals of the United Irishmen which provide the real justification for their relevance today? We remember them for their internationalism, their demand for universal equality and democracy, their hostility to the inherited privilege of aristocrats and monarchs, their enlistment of and care for the poor, their non-sectarianism, their multiculturalism, their insistence on the separation of church and state, their support for free and universal education, their pioneering of a free press, their demand for justice before the law, their eloquence and wit. I add that last item because I don't believe that any progressive movement can flourish unless there is an elan about it, involving, indeed, eloquence and also wit, humour, satire, and all those things that flourished during the era of the United Irishmen. Many of their principles remain unfulfilled. They could be described as a sort of proto-Bill of Rights, the Good Friday Agreement provided for the creation of a Northern Ireland Bill of Rights, just one aspect of the agreement that remains in abeyance. Look then at the demand for justice before the law. That manifestly has been denied to the victims of the Troubles, a failure now being compounded by the government's new legislation which will disbar victims from securing any restitution via the law. As to their demand for free and universal education, tell that to our debt-burdened students of today. What then of radical opposition to the hereditary aristocracy and monarchy? To those radicals of the 1790s, it would have seemed inconceivable that an hereditary monarchy could have survived more than two centuries later. They could not have imagined the deluge of royalist propaganda that we've all had to face on television, in the media, etc., over recent months. Some of those United Irish men were descendants of the Presbyterians who had arrived in Dublin with Cromwell in the 1650s and who were literally king killers. They had, after all, supported the execution of Charles I. As late as 1778, William Drennan, later the framer of the United Irish Oath, attended a dinner organised by the Washington Club and held to celebrate the anniversary of Charles's execution, and remarked, May tyrants tremble at the day. Come the fall of the Bastille, and the anti-monarchist pace quickened. Tom Paine's The Rights of Man became the Koran of Belfast, and his logic seemed irrefutable, indeed remains irrefutable, that the application of the hereditary principle provided for a dangerous lottery by which you might hope to have a wise monarch, but were just as likely to be lumbered with an infant, someone in their dotage, an idiot, a madman, a tyrant, or someone who was merely dim. Perhaps that's our current condition. All families have their dysfunctions, but we don't purport to be heads of state. What are we to make of the coronation of King Charles III? Why indeed was there a coronation costing taxpayers a hundred million pounds or more? Charles became king at a more modest ceremony immediately following the death of his mother. None of the few other remaining European monarchies dare to engage in separate coronation ceremonies. I talk of coronation ceremonies in the plural. Yes, 
Extraordinarily, Charles could not be satisfied with one. We had to go through it all again as he was crowned King of Scotland. The funeral of the Queen and the new coronations cost us a quarter of a billion pounds. It calls to mind those Roman emperors who, when faced by popular discontent, organised massive circuses by way of distraction. It was often not enough to save them. The coronation was the hallmark of a backward Britain. We were told that it would be modernised. What then are we to make of the anointing of the new king with holy oil from Jerusalem by the Archbishop of Canterbury? So Charles is God's gift to us, even if only 46% of his subjects count themselves as Christians. In the absence of a written constitution, that Victorian expert on protocol, Walter Baghot, still holds extraordinary sway. Writing in 1867, he argued against any parliamentary select committee to oversee the affairs of Queen Victoria, because the charm of royalty will be gone, its mystery is its life, we must not let in daylight upon its magic. Nor subsequently was daylight allowed to intrude. It has remained a convention that the role of the monarchy cannot be questioned by the elected Westminster Parliament. It is like the convention that prevented the discussion of Northern Ireland affairs for half a century, and we know where that got us. It has got even better than that for the royals. In 2011, David Cameron ensured that discussion of the sovereign grant would a remain secret, and b be subject to a golden ratchet by which it would never reduce. It currently amounts to 86 million a year, and in addition to that, the royal family receives more than 40 million a year in untaxed income from its vast property portfolio, with its estimated value of 16 billion. The question as to whether the many stupendous treasures held by the royal family, and many of them looted from the colonies, as with the Kohenor diamond, are their private property or belong to the state is often opaque. Nor on death are we allowed to catch up on where all that wealth is going. Royal wills are secret. The cost of the royal family is manifestly excessive, and especially in an era of increasing poverty. So am I arguing for a slimmed-down monarchy? No. In this day and age, the existence of an hereditary monarchy is simply an unacceptable anachronism. Nor in case any of you think that I'm engaging in an Irish Republican tirade, I would point to the long tradition of English republicanism, which actually informed early and radical republicanism on this island. I am aware that I may lay myself open to the accusation that I am attacking an institution particularly beloved by unionists and loyalists. They should remember that in an Irish context, opposition to this mode of governance developed almost exclusively within the Protestant community. Irish nationalism was much more enamoured by concepts of kingship and of the rule of unelected chieftains who they mistakenly assumed could do no wrong. Historically, there was a logical explanation for undying loyalty in an Ulster context. British monarchs were seen as the last bulwark against unwelcome reforms, and notably those that progressively empowered the Catholic majority on the island. At the time of the Act of Union in 1801, part of the deal was supposed to be that this would be combined with Catholic emancipation. 
The government wanted it, but fatally for British rule, King George vetoed it. Subsequently, the power of the monarchy to defy the wishes of the government has dwindled to nothing. Whatever the desires of unionists, the late Queen could not prevent all those landmark developments that they often opposed. Whether we're talking of the Anglo-Irish Agreement, the Good Friday Agreement, or the New Windsor Agreement, the Queen could not prevent Boris Johnson from illegally proroguing Parliament. King Charles cannot defend the Constitution because he lacks an elected mandate to do so. True that this is still constitutionally and disgracefully a Protestant monarchy, but if the king lacks any power to defend the faith, and more specifically the Protestant interest, this reduces to meaningless symbolism. Unionists and loyalists should avoid the bizarre trap of those South Sea Islanders who came to worship the Duke of Edinburgh as a god. I'm not asking them to give up vestiges of affection any more than I am asking them to give up their British citizenship. One can identify as British and be a member of Reclaim the Enlightenment. After all, our United Irish predecessors allied with English and Scottish radicals. But if you identify as British, you have a responsibility to retain the critical faculties essential to that citizenship and not least in relation to the monarchy. We hear that the monarchy is the mainstay of the tourist industry. The apex of your constitution surely requires a more convincing justification. In France, tourism flourishes, although they executed their king. More seriously, others argue that the monarchy provides for stability. I would argue that the monarchy provides for stasis, and as a break on change and modernization. It goes hand in hand with the continued and surely unsustainable established status of the Church of England, with the unelected House of Lords still with its quota of hereditary peers, with uncritical veneration of the armed forces, and with a corrupt honour system which still bizarrely offers an order of the British Empire. You cannot easily defenestrate a bad monarch, but you can get rid of a bad president by democratic vote. In recent decades, the Irish presidency has provided a model of how that role should function. It has limited powers, but provides constitutional oversight, and the last three office holders have acted in some ways as the conscience of the nation and in advance of the political establishment. They've been able to do so precisely because they have a democratic mandate. Am I crying in the wilderness? Opinion polls suggest that 26% of the English population favour a republic, as do 38% of those aged 18 to 24. It is a largely silenced minority, as was very evident on the day of the coronation, when supporters of Republic were arrested before they had done anything. It is not quite the white terror of the 1790s, but it is clear that many establishment defenders of the monarchy are ready to suppress civil liberties in that cause. And yet Liverpool fans booed the national anthem on the afternoon of the coronation. 10,000 demonstrated against the monarchy in Glasgow. And Prince William has been elevated to the status of Prince of Wales without any repetition of the absurd installation ceremony at Carnarvon Castle that his father enjoyed. They did not dare try it on in that increasingly assertive Welsh-speaking area. Nor did all go smoothly with that Edinburgh crowning, where cries of Not Our King almost drowned out the national anthem. 
Meanwhile, more members of the Commonwealth are on course to declare themselves as republics, as the past active role of our monarchs in slavery comes further to the fore. Yet for now, Britain does have an hereditary monarch as its head of state. What should the Irish response be? If we believe that good relations between Britain and Ireland are desirable, then we are bound to recognise the monarch as the representative of the British state, and in particular on state occasions. That requires courtesy, but it absolutely does not require curtsies or buying and scraping. We are all equals now. Yes, we should behave ourselves, but I say the writing is on the wall for our hereditary monarchy. For the moment it will stagger on, but it will become more and more evident that it is an expensive anachronism and a bulwark against wider constitutional reform and good government. We do have a guillotine on display today. I hasten to add that we're exhibiting it for purely symbolic purposes. Unfortunately, King Charles is not here to try it out. But in any case, we're actually opposed to capital punishment. So was Monsieur Guillotine. But when he realised that he could not win support for that enlightened stance, he provided the guillotine as a more humane form of execution. It was certainly more humane than the hang, drawing and quartering that prevailed here in the 1790s. Unfortunately, the guillotine was also more efficient and enabled executions to proceed on an industrial scale during the French Terror, or much later under the Nazi regime in Germany. Even if I'm certain that there is an overwhelming argument for the abolition of the monarchy, we should always remember that some Enlightenment ideas can go badly wrong. <laughs>